Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Chaz Arnett, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. We will discuss his article, From Decarceration to Ecarceration, which will be published in the Cardozo Law Review. So welcome to the show, Chaz. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's really all my, it's my pleasure. I, I, I saw your paper mentioned, I can't remember exactly where, and it, it struck my attention right away because this sort of new way of thinking about uh, punishment and sort of like surveillance is something that's really been on my mind. I think a lot of people's mind mind lately. Um, and your your take on it seems really provocative and and novel. Um, so I was wondering, you know, a lot of people I think are familiar with sort of the modern decarceration movement, but the term you use, yeah, but the term you use ecarceration is maybe novel to people. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Like, what do you mean by ecarceration? All right. So I can talk a little bit about ecarceration and I'm, you know, again, thanks for, for having me here. And, and, and part of what I've been, um, trying to do recently in my work is draw um, more attention to this to this area. Because when we think about um, some of the moves that have been happening in criminal justice uh, reform, there's been a lot of focus on policing and predictive policing. And um, there's a correctional uh, corollary here um, that isn't getting as much attention. Um, and that's what I'm trying to raise, uh, particularly um, in, in legal scholarship, but also um, those outside of uh, the field of um, uh, of law um, to get in tune and, and have a better understanding. Uh, ecarceration itself is is not a uh, a term that I um, developed, but a, a term that I heard um, and, uh, at least first being used by uh, an organization called the Center for Media Justice, um, and they have uh, a number of campaigns that they are um, managing uh, under the title of challenging ecarceration and. Uh, the end, ending digital prison. So let me sort of explain um, uh, what people have come to understand or, or sort of mean when they speak of e-carceration. Now, we know in, in thinking about mass incarceration and prison numbers, uh, most people are familiar with the fact that the U.S. Um, has, over the last uh, 50 years, um, almost now, seen such an extraordinary rise in the number of people in jails and prisons. And just within the last uh, last decade or so, we have uh, come to the understanding that this is not a good thing. Um, it's not a good thing for our country. It's not a good thing for um, our democracy. It's not a good thing for uh, communities and states. You think about it fiscally, you think about it uh, economically, you think about it morally, spiritually. Um, and there has been a drive, uh, particularly if you think about uh, the amount of people that are in jail uh, perhaps unnecessarily, right? Um, so you have seen um, a push for more people uh, to be outside of prisons, right? So that is what we mean when we talk about decarceration. It's literally um, strategies geared towards reducing prison populations. Decarceration has referred to some of the strategies that are being used in this movement towards decarceration or this decarceration push. For example, one of the leading practices um, that has been used or a tool that has been used um, with respect to releasing um, offenders or releasing those pretrial has been to place them under surveillance with an ankle monitor, right? And this uh, paper from decarceration to ecarceration um, focuses in on uh, the use of that policy in practice, where we say that, um, or the argument goes that if we are releasing individuals from jail, we need to ensure that uh, there is uh, public safety, that there is some level of security. And increasingly, we have said, well, the use of these um, tools can help us ensure public safety and security while at the same time decreasing um, jail populations, jail and prison uh, populations. And I am really uh, putting the microscope up to that, that argument to, you know, ask a few questions. One, um, is this tool really effective? Um, how, do we, how do we measure that? Um, and what are uh, some of the other um, 
causes uh, some of the other concerns that come along with using uh, this tool. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like a lot of people are familiar with the concept of ankle bla uh, kind of ankle monitors in the abstract, but maybe don't really have a very robust sense of what they're actually like and what that kind of monitoring really means. So, I mean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the experience of actually being subjected to that kind of monitoring is like. In other words, what's it like to wear an ankle monitor and what kinds of surveillance and restrictions are people who are wearing these devices subject to? Thinking about um, e-carceration, the E part, and uh, I don't think I've um, uh, fully spoke to the E part of the e-carceration is the uh, technological aspect of it, the um, the electronic features, right? So if we are thinking about um, strategies and tools that are being used in lieu of having a person sit in jail or in prison, um, those that fall in that digital digital realm um, have been referred to as e-carceration. That has included electronic ankle monitors uh, because they have the technological aspect to monitor and surveil and send communications uh, to justice departments, uh, correctional departments of a person's location. Uh, there have been other um, measures used in states like Maryland, where I, where I am now uh, currently, um, uh, using probation and parole kiosks where a person goes up and um, checks in and logs in their data, put in their uh, fingerprints. So e-carceration generally has uh, referred to these electronic forms of correctional uh, supervision, correctional monitoring. Um, the electronic ankle monitor in particular, uh, if a person is um, placed under electronic monitoring, they have to go and meet with a government um, uh, uh, agent, either usually uh, a person of a correctional department um, and or um, a third party agency, a number of uh, states, uh, cities and municipalities don't actually run uh, their electronic monitoring um, programs themselves. They outsource them to private companies. Um, and these private companies will go to a city, a county, uh, a state and say that we will monitor um, individuals that you believe need to be under supervision for free. And how we gain our money or how we make our money is that we'll charge the individual directly. Um, and that amount that a person play, uh, pays when they have the electronic monitor on uh, can range from $10 to uh, $40 uh, a day. Um, and almost all states in the U.S., all 50 states, um, use electronic monitoring, both at the juvenile level uh, with minors and adults as well. But when you actually are um, assigned to electronic monitoring, when you meet with an individual, uh, they will take the unit. The unit is, if you can imagine, say like a, uh, an oversized pager. So most people are familiar with pagers, it's old technology. Most doctors and hospitals are still using pagers, but think of a large pager with a rubber strap um, or plastic strap around it, right? So you could think of it as a really, really big um, watch, so to say. Uh, and most of these units will go onto your ankle. So they strap onto your ankle. The idea is that you cannot remove them at all during the time that you are under supervision. Um, the units need to be charged. So an individual, once you are placed on electronic monitoring, when you go home, uh, there is um, an outlet unit that works with your ankle monitor. So when it needs to be charged, you are sitting right next to the outlet, um, allowing it to, to, to charge up. That charging could take um, anywhere between an hour or a few hours. Um, and the juice um, or the energy along with those batteries, once they charge, um, could give you enough uh, battery power anywhere between six or 12 hours out of the day. Now, there are generally two type of um, electronic ankle monitors. One um, version is the radio frequency monitor in which um, focuses not on everywhere you go, but specifically your home. So if you have on uh, a radio frequency electronic monitor, it will alert correctional authorities when you leave your home. Uh, the other form of electronic monitoring is uh, works with global positioning systems, so GPS. 
And that form of electronic monitoring, which is increasingly used um, across the country, monitors you wherever you go. Uh, so there will be constant communication between the device and uh, the correctional authorities as to your location. So if a judge, uh, parole board um, decides that you are disallowed from going to a particular area of the city or uh, going uh, near schools or going near anywhere else uh, that, that may be associated with uh, your criminal conviction um, and you go near it, uh, there will be an alert um, and correctional authorities will uh, respond to wherever uh, you are. Now, for those who are under electronic monitoring, it is, it is, um, if you can imagine, um, you know, and I, I think about, um, because I, part of one of the things that I have done in, in, in researching the use of this practice is just look at the policies um, governing um, electronic monitoring. And because our correction system um, across the country is so decentralized, you can find different policies governing electronic monitoring from county to county, from city to city, from state to state. And, but there's one thing that's always um, uh, uh, seems to be the case regardless of the district or locale, and that is the restrictiveness of those, of those policies. Um, one of the policies that I've, I've looked at out of Pennsylvania, um, uh, Harrisburg area, uh, one of their statements that they put on the form that an individual has to sign when they're um, enrolling or participating in an electronic monitoring program um, notes that, uh, and, and this is roughly the language, I can't recall the language exactly, but they say something on the form along the lines of, if you want to know what you can do while on electronic monitoring, think about being in jail. If you cannot do it in jail, you cannot do it under electronic monitoring. So just to give a give a sense of how uh, it feels to be a, upon electronic monitoring, it's sort of like the taking uh, aspects of imprisonment, aspects of incarceration, and placing it within your home or within your community. One of the the uh, constant things uh, when I speak to individuals who are um, uh, participating in these electronic monitoring programs is that they feel like they are caged. They, they feel like, um, you know, they are animals or they feel like that, um, you know, they, they have an enormous sense of anxiety from knowing that there is constant surveillance of your every movement. And if you want to uh, uh, think about how um, deep and devastating that can be, um, uh, you know, because there is... Um, there is some value in, 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 in privacy and obscurity <laughs> as individuals in this, in, in this country. Many of our um, amendments and, and basic governmental values and democracy are based upon um, privacy, not only because it's uh, something that as individuals um, we need and cherish, but also it seems it's something that is necessary for us to uh, fully function as a democracy, um, being able to have privacy. Um, Take that and juxtapose it to the fact that there are numerous states um, in, the in, in the U.S. that allow for lifetime electronic monitoring. So not just, you know, up until your trial or not just a few years after uh, you're released on parole or not as a six month uh, sentence period, but for the duration of the rest of your life once placed on electronic monitoring. Uh, that um, reality creates... Um, real divides between those who are being placed under surveillance and other citizens and other community members, right? You are easily identifiable um, from these ankle units, which are not uh, sleek or <laughs> non-noticeable. Um, they're easily identifiable. And those have impacts on employment. Those have impacts on uh, schooling for minors. Um, those have uh, impact on familial relationships and the cost, of course, uh, create additional burdens for individuals and for their families as well. So it's, it's, it creates um, a number of pressures which seem counterintuitive uh, to uh, an individual being able to successfully uh, reintegrate into society once they have criminal, criminal justice involvement and contact. So, yeah, I mean, reading your paper, I really started to understand in a much more concrete way what it's actually like 
to be subject to this kind of electronic surveillance. And like, ironically, it almost just seems like substituting one form of incarceration for another, like almost you're kind of nominally out of prison, but the prison is kind of, kind of virtually still around you. I mean, especially when it comes to like this combination of like stigma, like, are almost arbitrary rules that don't make any sense, like really restrictive rules as well. And also this kind of capacity for kind of like unexpected or almost like expectedly unexpected, like misenforcement or misunderstanding that can lead to sort of totally unpredictable punishment. Not to mention the fact that it's like you're now all of a sudden sort of paying for your own incarceration, even though it's like incredibly difficult to sort of get the kind of work you would need in order to actually cover the cost. I mean, the whole thing is just, it's like decarceration without decarceration. Indeed, and that is and 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 that is one of the things that struck me that sort of got me initially interested in this area and and, and doing research for many years. I was a I was a public defender um, handling uh, cases, and I had um, I had seen um, individuals on electronic monitoring um, before becoming a lawyer. Um, when I was a public defender in New Orleans and in Baltimore, um, even in court, I mean, I would I would argue for individuals to be released on. Um, electronic monitoring. So I don't want to present it as um, a, a situation in which, um, you know, a, electronic monitoring um, is the exact same or presents the exact uh, dilemmas as being locked away or caged in, in, in a jail or prison because it doesn't. Um, and uh, individuals, you know, if there is a choice between being locked up or being released, even if it's under twenty four seven surveillance, uh, time and time again, people will uh, will say, "Release me on electronic monitoring." But I, I think when we have that uh, comparison just between being in jail and being on electronic monitoring, that it obscures our uh, investigation into the uh, penal access and penal um, uh, problems that are presented by electronic monitoring in and of itself um, without such uh, a comparison. If we are presenting uh, the use of these ankle monitors as a way to move away from mass incarceration, as a way to reduce prison populations, we have to thoroughly investigate that, uh, whether or not that is actually happening. And I, and I suspect um, that it's not happening to the degree that we believe. I do not think that these tools are as effective um, as we believe they are, which raises a question as to why we use them. Um, I wrote a paper uh, called Virtual Shackles, um, which looks at the use of electronic monitor, ankle monitors in uh, the juvenile justice system with minors, um, because it struck me, I'd seen it being used, I'd um, um, even argued for it at the, the, the adult level. And years later, I began to take some juvenile cases and represent individuals in juvenile juvenile court um, in Baltimore, and I saw uh, kids as young as 10 years old being placed on these electronic ankle monitors for these minor offenses. Um, it became almost a go-to for, for judges and magistrates to um, protect against anything that happens or negative that could happen from releasing an individual, right? It, it is seen as a, a backup play. Why not uh, place an individual on electronic monitoring? monitoring just in case if something happens while they're um, out, I have the cover to say, well, I placed them under monitoring and I can point my finger um, at those who are conducting the supervision. Um, and that will ensure that I'm not being soft or uh, that I'm still able to, um, you know, seek, seek re-election for my, for my judgeship or my, my magistrate um, position. But I, I sort of looked at the use on minors and that's why I, I began my focus because that is the most sympathetic, uh, in my eyes, um, uh, uh, individual or, or place to begin with this um, with this tool. And I ask whether or not this is in the spirit of, of uh, juvenile rehabilitation. Um, and after examining it, I, I come down um, on the side that it's not in line with uh, how we think about rehabilitation and reintegration uh, for minors and, and certainly not uh, with adults as well. Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like 
the people who are subject to or potentially subject to this kind of surveillance to some degree really feel that in a visceral way that the people imposing it don't. And you used an analogy or you quoted an analogy in your article that I thought was really kind of horrifying, but also seem that we, as soon as I read it, it seemed so true. It was like, you know, if you give people a choice between slavery and Jim Crow, they'll choose Jim Crow, but that doesn't mean Jim Crow is a good thing. It's still a terrible thing. It's just better than maybe are marginally better than the all, exactly. all alternative. And that this is kind of the same situation. And, and, and that was one of the things that I think actually initially struck me about your paper when I first heard about it was that you, mean, you actually have some sort of survey data from the state where I live, Kentucky, among other places, sort of talking about the actual choices that people potentially subject to this kind of surveillance made. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that information, about that data, and what it sort of tells us about the sort of lived experience of being subject to this kind of surveillance. Indeed. And, and, and the quote you were referencing was from uh, Michelle Alexander, um, author of The uh, New Jim Crow. And she, she talks about um, e-carceration in our New York Times piece and, and refers to it as the newest uh, Jim Crow um, and, and, and really examines and, and looks at uh, this push um, for predictive uh, criminal justice measures. So if you think about algorithms and, and, and predictive uh, criminal behavior technology that is um, constantly being discussed and, and, and pushed, uh, that is having its, its way in uh, criminal uh, correction circles as well. And electronic monitoring is intimately tied to that push for predictive um, policing, right? If you um, and predictive uh, corrections as well. Um, part of uh, the process of placing an individual on electronic monitoring is determining whether or not that individual is worthy of surveillance. And that often comes from the use of risk assessments. Um, and and, and uh, that is um, the biggest uh, focus in uh, criminal justice circles now is how can we predict or uh, ward off against uh, criminal behavior that could come in the future, almost in a minority report sort of way. <laughs> and um, when an, an individual gets a risk score, that determines whether or not they are uh, worthy of being on electronic monitoring. Um, with respect to the Kentucky study, that was very interesting. And it, and it ties in um, something that I discovered it throughout doing this research is that um, these practices, these e-carceration practices have particular impacts on the same populations, the same populations that were disproportionately impacted by mass incarceration. And that is uh, communities of color and poor communities right, are being impacted disproportionately um, by these these practices. And the in interesting thing about the Kentucky study was that they looked at individuals who were um, prisoners who were um, close to uh, their release date from jail. And they were given uh, a choice um, in, in this study. Um, and they were asked whether or not, um, or how much time um, they were willing to spend on electronic monitoring versus being in jail. Now, I forget the exact survey questions, but the gist of it is um, they were getting at or trying to determine how much additional prison time would an individual do in order to avoid any time on electronic monitoring, right? So if you had 12 months left, if you could uh, do 13 months to avoid four months on electronic monitoring after you were released, would you be willing to do that? And that's, that's roughly sort of what it, 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 it got at. How much additional, how longer would you stay in jail to avoid any time on electronic monitoring? And the, uh, the results had some interesting um, uh, uh, you know, questions, uh, raised some questions around uh, race, uh, because one of the things, one of the major findings from it was that when uh, white prisoners were given this question um, at this facility, overwhelmingly, they um, were willing to immediately go on electronic monitoring and not do any additional time in a uh, correctional facility. And with the African-American uh, prisoners, they overwhelmingly 
uh, were willing to do more time in prison, right? And how much additional time varied, right? Uh, but they were overwhelmingly more willing to do uh, time in prison to avoid any measure of, of time spent on electronic monitoring. Now, you see those results and you begin to wonder, well, is electronic monitoring experienced differently um, along uh, the lines of race? Uh, what would account for that, right? And some people may think, and thinking about electronic monitoring, well, wasn't Gertie Madoff, wasn't uh, Martha Stewart <laughs> on electronic monitoring? Um, what's the big deal, right? And some people may even view that as uh, a slap on the wrist um, sort of punishment. Uh, but the way that electronic monitors um, are experienced across race, racial boundaries, across class um, boundaries is completely different, right? It has uh, significant impacts on employment prospects, right? Being able to fund um, and pay your uh, costs of the program cause devastating facts and, and fights within your own family, um, choices between whether to which bills to pay versus um, whether you have your father or your brother, um, your sister, your aunt, uh, remain at home on electronic monitoring, right? You can imagine uh, the sorts of um, uh, uh, debates, uh, the sorts of uh, infighting that, that could cause within a particular family or household, um, the impacts that it has on um, your health benefits, um, the impact that it has on your friends, your democratic participation, your civic participation, um, and the like. Um, and one of the things that I, I say in this paper is that I believe that the use of electronic monitoring is uh, is contributing to uh, greater social marginalization of individuals um, who are placed on these tools. Um, when you are subjected to uh, greater surveillance by the criminal justice system, that does not um, act as um, as uh, an initiator. Uh, for uh, further or uh, greater civic engagement, right? Uh, it actually acts as um, a barrier, forces individuals to shy away from uh, necessary institutions, such as educational institutions, medical institutions, um, and employment opportunities and institutions. Um, and, and this is seen in Sarah Brain's uh, work um, on system avoidance theory, which I, I touch on in the paper as well. But the general um, uh, argument seems to be um, that as you create uh, these additional barriers to electronic monitoring, uh, that is counteractive uh, to what we believe rehabilitation uh, and reintegration should be about. Um, and I, I think we really need to sit down and, and, and think about what the goals of uh, criminal justice reform are. Um, if you look at the biggest criminal justice reforms over the last, just the last year, right? You think about the state of California um, has, has moved to in cash bail. Uh, you think about President Trump uh, signing the second act uh, uh, chance uh, bill. Um, and both of those, both of those moves prominently feature the use of electronic monitors. It is increasingly seen as the next thing to go Go to, even though the technology itself is 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 not um, is not new. Uh, electronic ankle monitor has been around for a while, but in this movement towards decarceration, we are saying that electronic ankle monitors should play a significant role in releasing individuals. We say that it is good for public safety. We say that it is good because we're saving money, um, and we are less concerned about what the potential harms should be. And I I I, I seriously worry about why uh, we aren't asking further questions. And you gave the example Michelle Alexander gave, but another example I usually give uh, when I talk about this is that, you know, take a, take a school, for example, say, say your kid is in uh, elementary school and um, your child is being bullied by, you know, three kids in, a, in, in your child's classroom, right? One is throwing spitballs, the other one is poking them in the air, the other one is, you know, calling them uh, crazy names, right? And let's say that the school responds and says, um, this is how we're going to solve this problem of your child being bullied. We're going to move them into another classroom uh, where they will be at by themselves. Uh, we will give them a tablet and they will be able to watch and monitor 
uh, what happens in the other classroom and learn that way. <laughs> now, most parents would say, what? <laughs> like, and ask, we have some additional questions here. Uh, yes, you have solved the problem of bullying, uh, but did it, is this the best um, scenario or situation for my child to learn? And I think in the context of electronic monitoring and criminal justice reform, we don't ask those additional questions. We say, well, jail is bad. This is how we will solve jail. We will place you on electronic uh, ankle monitors. And then we don't ask any further questions about, uh, is this the best thing for rehabilitation? Uh, is this the best tool for reintegrating an individual in society? And what are the harms? Um, there are uh, several initiatives to gather more data about the impact of the use of electronic monitoring, about the disparities um, that come along, racial class disparities uh, that come along with electronic monitoring. For example, the state of Illinois, uh, the House just passed a bill uh, this, this summer, which will mandate state Department of Corrections to document and collect data on when electronic monitors are assigned, who are they being assigned to, how much is being spent on them, the success rate, et cetera. Um, and a number of states are hopefully in, in the next year or so are going to follow behind and try to gather more accurate data on uh, the benefits and the drawbacks of the use of this technology, because currently uh, the data isn't there to show that it is effective. Um, and what we know anecdotally is that it is impacting others more than um, uh, uh, general population. So, Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Chaz, in, in closing, I mean, I, I, I feel like there, the, de, the decarceration movement, or at least parts of the decarceration movement have sort of looked to, as you acknowledge in our talk and in your paper, sort of technological fixes that will sort of enable institutions to move in a decarceral sort of direction, including ankle bracelets and other forms of electronic monitoring. And, and, and I feel like in your paper, you point out some really kind of profound and troubling problems with that approach. I mean, I wonder if, 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 if you had a takeaway for people who are, you know, sort of in favor of decarceration and thinking about how we should sort of conceptualize the goals of decarceration as a movement, what would you have to say to them about sort of what electronic monitoring means and how sort of what we've seen it doing in practice should inform the way we think about whether or not that's a tool that we should think about and to what extent it should be part of the toolkit for decarceration. Yeah. And I mean, that's a, that's a good question. And I, and I think it's, you know, and I, the, the example I give, uh, just gave about uh, the school and if, if you had a kid and um, they solved the uh, problem of bullying by moving the kid to an additional a, a different classroom, um, the parent would have um, a number of questions, right? They wouldn't be satisfied. And I think um, in, in many ways, we are satisfied uh, with this idea that, well, we place an individual on uh, this form of surveillance and monitor them 24 seven, instead of having them in gym, in jail, uh, we are satisfied for that with that because I think of the, because of how we think about the, the people who are, uh, coming in contact with the criminal justice system, right? I, I think, uh, there is, um, much assumption that the individuals who come in contact with the criminal justice system need to be placed under some form of surveillance. We have these ideas about who it is, who is in jail, what it means uh, to be a criminal offender, right? Um, and I think that is why we don't ask these additional questions. We assume that surveillance is needed um, to monitor these individuals. And um, that, hasn't, that hasn't shown to be true. What is shown to be most effective for individuals, whether they are pre-trial, uh, whether it is um, post-conviction or whether it is um, uh, parole, uh, after parole, is the most effective thing for an individual returning to the community is employment. And that is having a consistent, steady job with um, a livable wage, right? A significant um, uh, wage so that they can afford and, and, and take care of themselves. That has shown to be beyond anything, beyond having family contact, 
uh, beyond uh, having uh, to meet with a correctional officer every other day, beyond uh, ankle monitors, is having a job. Um, and yet, uh, again and again, um, I hear uh, when I talk about electronic monitoring, people say, well, if not these monitors, what is the alternative? And quite frankly, I, I think that instead of trying to find uh, the perfect pill um, to, to cure uh, uh, rehabilitation or reintegrative uh, programming and corrections, I think we need to think about instead of the golden ultimate alternative program, we need to think about alternative uh, goals, alternative uh, aims and priorities and mindsets of uh, what we think or believe criminal justice reform entails and means. Now, there have been a lot of um, opinions on that front. Uh, one of that, one of those fronts is, is abolition, right? Should we uh, abolish how we, the current forms of jail and incarceration, right? Should we abolish uh, these methods of electronic uh, incarceration and digital uh, surveillance, right? I think those are things that we need to wrestle with. And the mind state that I, I think um, that we need to approach when we think about electronic monitoring, and of course, electronic monitoring, as I noted, is, uh, is, isn't is uh, the newest technology. I think we need to be prepared for additional technologies that are going to come down the road. These electronic monitors now uh, tell you where an individual is located. However, they have been piloting programs in which uh, correctional officers can uh, tune in um, to or tap into uh, an ankle unit and listen into conversations that people are having at any point without consent. Uh, there are uh, electronic monitors uh, being proposed that can um, debilitate a person, you know, shock them, knock them out. Um, <laughs> and, you know, in the, uh, you actually had a, a legislator in, in um, I think it was in Dayton, Ohio, a advocate uh, for, for these um, electronic monitors that can actually do harm to an individual. Right. That is a way uh, in, 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 in their eyes that we can prevent and secure safety. Um, but I, I, I think at the end of the day, um, I think we have to have this at the forefront of our mind. We are at a stage in um, uh, of our society and with respect to criminal justice that we are venturing into new territory in terms of predicting behaviors and trying to identify criminals before they engage in criminal conduct. What does that mean? What do we do with this, this data that we're gathering from where a person goes on an electronic ankle monitor, right? What do we do uh, with electronic ankle monitors that can test for drugs and, and alcohol? When the, uh, I guess the corollary to the electronic monitor involves into a chip, you know, what are the conversations there? I think we need to be prepared for that uh, because in many ways I could ultimately see us hitting in that uh, direction. But the mind state that we need to have in thinking about um, uh, which direction to go in criminal justice, it has to be a focus on rehabilitation. It has to be focused on what is most effective if we are reducing our prison populations, which have been operating at maximum capacity for the last couple of decades. What is What do these individuals who are leaving prisons, right, or individuals at the front end who are being steered away from uh, prisons and jails, what do they need? What is involved, uh, what is necessary for, you know, social safety net uh, for them? And I think if we, our focus is there, we will begin to develop the programs that are necessary to ensure that we have better outcomes, because the outcomes now with electronic monitoring um, aren't, aren't good, right? There's no uh, demonstrated uh, benefit between the use of electronic monitoring and recidivism. In fact, if you talk to people who are looking at and studying electronic monitoring and those who have been placed on electronic monitoring um, recently, it is ultimately set up to send an individual back into prison. If you can't afford it, right, if you stop making your payments, you end up back in jail. Um, in some jurisdictions, if you, um, you know, go grocery shopping, uh, you can be violated. If you're, you work overtime and uh, you go to a job that is out of a certain radius, you can be violated for, for employment reasons, right? It's so easy for you to end up back in prison. And we need to be focused on what keeps people in the community, 
what keeps people in their homes and what keeps people engaged um, in, in their communities and, and in this uh, this country at this time. So I, I hope I tweak some people's interests um, in this area and I'll continue to, to, to be working on the front lines and those who are on the ground um, pushing further research and, and interest in this area. Great. Well, Chaz, I can see you've certainly caught my attention <laughs> and it's been fantastic talking to you about this excellent paper. Uh, I can't, I can't wait to see until it's in print in, in the Cardozo Law Review. And uh, I look forward to sharing this with, with the audience. Indeed. Thank you so much, Brian. I love your podcast. I'll see you all later. <laughs> Christmas in prison and the food was real good. We had turkey and pistols carved out of wood. And I dream of her always, even when I don't dream. Her name's on my tongue and her blood's in my strength. Wait a while, eternity. Oh, my nature's got nothing on me. Run to me, come to me now We're rolling, my sweetheart We're blowing by God Of a chess game with someone I admire Or a picnic in the rain After a prairie fire Her heart is as big as This old goddamn gel And she's sweeter than saccharin At a drugstore safe Wait a while, eternity Oh, my love, nature's got nothing on me Run to me, come to me now We're rolling, my sweetheart We're flowing by God Light in the big yard swings round with the gun and spotlights, snowflakes like the dust in the sun. It's Christmas in prison, there'll be music tonight. I'll probably get homesick. I love you, good night. Wait a while, eternity. Oh, my nature's got nothing on me. To me, run to me, come to me now. We're ruling my sweetheart, we're flowing back up. John Prine, born in Maywood, Illinois.